Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to start these proceedings talking about cystic psychosis in general and uh, mostly focusing on the pig. Okay, and just a brief overview of what I'm going to discuss is I'm going to start with an introduction about Petenia tapeworms in general. Uh, the zoonotic ones, how do they fit in? There's also non-zoonotic ones. And then discuss the life cycle of Tinea solium specifically. And go over to epidemiology and the various risk factors. Where do we need to focus our control as far as Tinea solium cystosicosis is concerned? The diagnostic techniques, how useful are they? What can we do with them? And then move on to tools for the control of tinea solium, which ties in very much with the risk factors. Okay, tinias in general, tinea tapeworms, they are long segmented tapeworms, consists of lots of what's called little proglottids. And there, this gentleman, Dr. M. Dao, is showing a human tapeworm. That one specifically is tinea saginata, which causes disease in cattle. And they can be quite big. Units. Up to seven meters, I've even heard lengths of 25 meters mentioned. Uh, one report talks about a tapeworm of 50 meters. Which um, All of these tapeworms have an, what's called an indirect life cycle, which is where the problems come in. You have the definitive host and the intermediate host. Definitive host is the host that carries the actual tapeworm, that long, nasty parasite. And the intermediate host carries the larval stages of this parasite. We call them the cysticerci, uh, parasitic intermediate stages. I prefer to call them just parasitic intermediate stages. <coughs> okay, not all of them are zoonotic. There's examples of a few of the zoonotic tapeworms. And then a few of them, the human is the definitive host, meaning humans carry the actual worm. And then there's a whole host of them where animals carry the tapeworm. The various diseases, the terminology that's used, teniasis refers to infection with the actual tapeworm. And usually that doesn't cause too many problems. Uh, humans are usually aware that they do have a tapeworm. Sometimes they're not. And then your larval intermediate stages cause those diseases, cystosicosis, neurocystosicosis, and there's also what's referred to as scenariosis, or neurocenariosis. From the livestock point of view, our problem with this disease is it causes economic losses. Pigs, cattle, sheep, goats, heavily infected with parasitic intermediate stages of these parasites, have to be condemned, or at least awful in some cases. Okay, cystosicosis, that specific disease, the most important parasites from veterinary science's point of view and from the human perspective is Tinea solium, Tinea saginata, Hydatogena and Ovis. Okay, and then bovine cystosicosis, one that's caused by <coughs> Tinea saginata, where the actual adult tapeworm occurs in, cat, in, in human beings. And then the intermediate stage, the cystosicosis, that occurs in cattle. And then the one that's of most interest to us in this workshop is Tinea solium, the porcine uh, cystosicosis, where uh, humans as well carry the tapeworm. And here's a nice example, just to get to this. Uh, we get what is called in veterinary science heavy infestations and then mild infestations. There's the little cyst, parasitic <coughs> intermediate stage. And it's these mild infestations that give us the most problems. And then just to complete the picture, there's also cystosicosis in other species, not necessarily all of them, uh, pathogenic to human beings or a zoonosis. The one that is pathogenic is Hydatogena. Hydatogena, that can also occur in pigs. So you can also find a cycle between Hydatogena and the dog, which is the definitive host for the, this parasite. 
So a cycle between dogs and humans, or a cycle between pigs and humans. Although that disease is quite rare. Scenariosis, also just to complete the picture, that's caused by tinea multiceps. Tinea multiceps is also a zoonosis, and also causes in human beings. And your definitive host for those is usually carnids. There's many more species of these, these parasites. It's not only tinea multiceps that causes zoonotic diseases or diseases in livestock. Uh, there's a few others that have been identified, but they're of minor importance. Okay, life cycle of tinea solium. Life cycle, we'll start there in the small intestine of the human being with the adult tapeworm. This tapeworm takes about three months to <coughs> become adult and then starts to produce what's called proglottids. And the proglottids are passed in the feces of human beings. And under unhygienic conditions, pigs with that gain access to feces eat these proglottids or eggs from the proglottids end up on vegetation. And that's how pig develops the infection. Then parasite enters the intestines of the pig, hatches, passes the intestinal wall, and the cystocerci develop generally in muscle tissues, but they can also develop in other locations, such as the brain. Pigs can also get neurocystocercosis from this disease. Um, again, fairly rare. Most commonly, cystocerci occur in the muscles. Okay, humans then in turn become infected by eating meat that is undercooked or raw. Just an example, again, somewhere there is one little parasite called your light infestation. The ones that are difficult to detect and also quite difficult to convince a farmer to condemn a pig with a light infestation. And heavy infestations, aesthetically unacceptable, usually not a problem to convince people not to eat that. Like I said, humans eat that meat. Tapeworm develops in the intestines of the human being. I said the worms can become quite large, develop proglottids. And that is the proglottids referred to. Uh, specifically a tinea solium proglottid. Now humans can pass at least about six of these per day and since they have approximately 50,000 eggs in one proglottid that means one human being can spread about 300,000 of these eggs per day. Then the aberrant life cycle of tinea solium. So normally the human should only get the parasite, the adult tapeworm in their intestines, Sometimes, by accident, human beings consume the eggs from these parasites. And that usually happens with improper hygiene, not washing hands often enough, self-contamination of great concern, child caregivers, people who look after children during the day, grandparents, those who stay at home, don't wash their hands often enough, and children, by accident, ingest these eggs. Food handlers as well, somebody who prepares the food in the household and manages to spread this to the rest of the household. And that mode of transmission usually leads to neurocystocercosis. Cystocercosis in general, but also neurocystocercosis. Another route is retroperistalsis. A proglottid uh, moves from the small intestine back into the stomach and then eggs enter the human being uh, through, also across the intestinal wall and enter the tissues of the human being. <coughs> okay, human cystocercosis. Generally in the skeletal muscle, subcutaneous cysts. This was a case diagnosed in South Africa uh, in 2004. You can notice those little nodules. This patient actually 
was treated and then came back again, reinfected himself again. The neurocystocytosis, <coughs> that's the worst outcome of this disease in human beings. Notice all of these cysts in the brain of this human being, which causes epilepsy and other neurological symptoms. Uh, note that there's a disease called neurocineriosis, like I mentioned before, <coughs> caused by tinea multiceps and other tinea species. Generally, those cysts are a lot bigger from the pictures I've seen. They're, they're not these tiny little cysts. From a veterinary perspective, um, we would like the medical profession to try at least and identify exactly which tinea species that human being is infected with because the control measures are going to differ. Do we need to focus on pigs? Do we need to focus on dogs? Okay, geographic distribution. These parasites are distributed worldwide. Wherever there's pigs or dogs, there's tinea species and tinea solium. However, it does occur more frequently in your low-income, low-economic areas. Okay, and this disease, uh, due to the rapid expansion of pig farming in Africa, is increasing, is on the increase. We're finding it more and more. Pig populations, oh, that was just in 1996. Since 1961, uh, pig populations have more than tripled. Okay, what's the risk factors for this disease? The number one risk factor is poor hygiene, poor sanitation in an area, and an absence of latrines. And of course, even if there are latrines available, people sometimes don't use them. The old plus toilet, the long drop. Um, so I can understand why people often don't want to use them. They don't smell good. You find all sorts of insects in there. Okay. So because of the open field defecation, you usually find in these low-income areas, um, the area becomes quite heavily contaminated with worms. And if by accident people also keep pigs, pigs become infected. Of great concern is water. One of the concerns mentioned in one of the reports is a lack of piped water. Come the rainy season, all of these feces uh, gets washed into the river systems. And I've had a report from one feedlot that states that they've controlled the source from where they get their cattle. They've controlled their personnel but they have no control over the water. And by deduction, they've figured out that's where their cystosicosis problem is coming from. Water with <coughs> cystosicosis or tinea solium eggs in it or tinea saginata eggs in it. Uh, this report was published in 1991 where somebody mentioned that the effluent or sewage treatment is not always effective in removing these eggs from water. Hopefully, 25, 20 years down the line, we now have better filters, and that's not a problem, although I don't know. Second risk factor, free-ranging or scavenging pigs. Pigs walking around freely. They're not kept in a pigsty. Um, farmers like to do this. They don't have to feed them a formal commercial ration, pigs scavenge, find their own food, and they don't have to maintain a pig's time. Uh, and then you get rather strange practices where human feces is deliberately fed to the pigs, or even where pig pens are connected to the pig's time. I'm not aware of this in South Africa, where exactly that report came from. Okay, another risk factor is poor education. People in low-income areas, they've had four subjects in matric, or six subjects, four of them were languages, one was home economics, and another one something else, but not biology. 
very difficult subject biology, so it's very difficult to explain to people the life cycle of this parasite. So they're found in some areas, even with intense in education programs, it's difficult to get the population to grasp exactly the relation between the cyst that they see in the muscles of the pig and the tapeworm. They do recognize the epilepsy, they know there's epilepsy in the area, they know some of their family members, community members are carrying tapeworms, but they don't they can't make the connection. So it's difficult to explain to them. So now confronted with a pig that's got a few cysts in it, and now you want them to throw this into a ditch and bury it. Just doesn't happen. Okay, so even if there is meat inspection, enforcing the law, or what is required, freezing that carcass, um, having a box freezer available and freezing it for 10 days at minus 10 degrees Celsius, that's quite difficult to enforce in low-income areas. Okay, and then what is also found is your normal practices of cooking pork doesn't kill these sister circi, simply grilling, frying, or baking in an oven doesn't kill all of them. Okay, what's the situation in South Africa? Okay, they estimate that at least 25% of the pigs being reared in South Africa are free range. They walk around scavenging for food. And the problem seems to be more prevalent in the Eastern Cape province, or well, it could also be that's just the province where most of the studies have been done. Uh, and the prevalence from a recent article by Kreshek et al., they estimate that the prevalence using Bayesian methods at 56.7%. Okay, when I discuss the diagnostic techniques, I'll explain all of these. There's very, very, a lot of discrepancies in prevalence figures being reported. And I tend to be more believing in those high figures rather than the figures that say less than 10%. Okay, and then the article goes on to explain why they think this occurs more in the Eastern Cape. Uh, they reckon because unemployment there is highest, so people are by necessity need to farm with animals to survive. There's no pipe water in most homes. Fairly decent amount, but still not enough. Um, latrines, that's the worst. Only about 14% of homes in those areas have latrines. Okay, this is based on statistics dating back to around 2001, so the situation might have improved. And then other provinces. We don't really know what the situation in other provinces is. And in fact, this whole thing, this workshop was initiated because we became aware of an outbreak of cystic psychosis in pigs here in Gauteng, in the Rurapurt area. The SPCA phoned us and told us, we just confiscated 50 pigs and had them slaughtered with the idea of compensating the owners, and then 35 of the 50 pigs were condemned for cystic psychosis. And of course, the community then, after that, didn't want to voluntarily give up their pigs. And in trying, I've tried to give them advice, so contact health authorities, uh, contact NICD, but no response. I think eventually um, Gauteng State Veterinary Services went to investigate and started the study to investigate what is actually the prevalence of cystic psychosis in Gauteng. But how do you do that with the limited diagnostic techniques that are available? So I use these two articles simply because both of them use Bayesian statistics and they used more than one technique to diagnose the disease and then compare that and then use the statistics to come up with prevalence rates which are more believable. Okay. The techniques in general, the gold standard is you have to slaughter the pig and cut it into little strips a half a centimeter wide because the cyst is only about a half a centimeter. 
And not only just the muscles, you also have to cut the lungs and the liver and the heart and the tongue into half centimeter slices. So this previous Dorney et al, they actually did that. They bought pigs in some North African countries at slaughter slabs and they used that method to compare with different other diagnostic techniques. Specifically tongue palpation, routine meat inspection and then some serological tests. Okay, and those authors came up with these figures, these sensitivities and specificities. Tongue palpation, only about 7.3 to 21% specific. It all depends on what technique you use. Some people simply just pull the tongue out and have a look at it. They don't actually palpate it, so the sensitivity decreases. It increases slightly if you do palpate the tongue. Trouble is, tongue palpation is not going to pick up those light infestations. It will only pick up very, very high infestations, and then only in about half of the cases of high infestation does tongue palpation actually work. And then your routine meat inspection, better than nothing. Uh, that author found 38.7% sensitivity with 100% specificity, but what we're interested in is the sensitivity because we need a screening test. We want to screen pigs and prevent them from entering into the human food chain. So 38.7%, not great. Also doesn't pick up the low infestations. Okay, and then there's various serological techniques. Most of them are of academic interest. They're used in an epidemiology study or in, they're useful for studying prevalence. So, what the researchers do is they do all four tests, the tongue palpation, meat inspection, and serology, compare those tests, put it into a Bayesian model, and then you get a fairly accurate estimate of prevalence. Still not sensitive enough. These are the antigen ELISAs. Antibody ELISA, not much better than meat inspection. Okay, so you do get improved sensitivity with these serological tests, but they are not much use. Um, in routine diagnoses, and of course, there's cross reactions with tinea hadatogena, so you're not necessarily going to pick up tinea solium always. Okay, control of cystic psychosis. I found this article, Manuel Asana. He sort of summarized all of it best, went and researched all the techniques used in various countries, and states the most effective. Effective method is have an industrial revolution. Okay. That's why European countries, North America, Australia, don't have a problem with this disease. It's rarely diagnosed there. Usually people who travel to other countries come back having contracted the disease. Okay. In the absence of an industrial revolution, what you can do is try to convince farmers to confine their pigs. But like I mentioned, they're not really keen to do this then they have to build a big sky and they have to feed this pig. And unfortunately, some feed feces to the pig. Meat inspection um, is effective to some degree, but again, how to convince, and this is clearly highlighted in this report, uh, where the researchers went to these slaughter slabs and watched the proceedings and, and there was a meat inspector there or a meat examiner and the meat examiner usually ignored the light infestation so they were not prepared to condemn them. Okay, then there's also intensive educational interventions. This was done in Peru. They had a very intensive effort to, to teach people about the disease and what they found was yes, uh, people eventually recognize the measly pork and they avoid to eat that. Uh, but they don't understand the life cycle. So it's very short term. Uh, it only works for a, for a short while. Chemotherapy, mostly also done in South America where they used widespread chemotherapy. Trouble is you have to get every single person to come for a dose of anti -almintic. And you have to repeat this. 
on a regular basis. If we don't control the disease in the pigs, the cycle just carries on. So what then some countries did was let's try chemotherapy in humans and in the pigs. Trouble though is oxfendazole is quite successful, but it can take anywhere from two months to six months before the parasite is killed. So in the meantime, the human beings ate the pigs that are still infected and the cycle carries on. Latest solution, a novel method, is combining all of those other interventions with vaccination. This was done in Cameroon recently, where they vaccinated pigs using uh, what Tineosolium strain 18 and Tineosolium 16 vaccine. What they did find is that uh, you do have to use uh, vaccinate twice. So you vaccinate, vaccinate again, and then go back once those pigs are immune, so they can no longer develop cystocerca in the meat, they have to go back and treat them with oxfendazole because the vaccination is not going to kill the existing parasites in the meat. And then you still have to do all the other interventions to keep farmers bringing their pigs back for revaccination. We still have to teach them about the life cycle and the dangers of this disease. So in short, to me, this is just as important as rabies. However, we need the help of the medical profession. We need to be made aware of these, these cases. Uh, institutions like the SPCA, our colleagues, animal health technicians, who know where these pigs are, and who can look out for cases of epilepsy, you know, there's pigs, there's humans, there's epilepsy, probably there's neurocystosis there. And then start these intervention programs. Maybe try to import this vaccine and see if it works. <laughs>